Hello everyone, welcome again to another Life Group as we continue our For the Generations to Come sermon series. Before we get into the teaching for tonight, I'd love for you as a group to share with each other uh, who is the person in your life uh, that you have respected the most. Uh, I think it's probably cheating to choose your spouse if that's who you would have chosen. So pick somebody who's not your spouse, uh, the person you respected the most in your life. Maybe it was a coach, maybe it was a teacher, maybe it was a parent. Uh, share that person with your life group. As we got into the teaching on 1 Timothy chapter 6 from the Sunday, uh, we were hit over the head right away with a powerful phrase from the Apostle Paul to Timothy. He says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. And we talked in the sermon how about, how about how you can have godliness, but if you don't have contentment, it won't be great gain. And very often for Christians, it's, it's easy to be giving and generous like God is, but we do it often with a lack of contentment. Uh, so I'd love for you to share with your group, what area of your life do you find yourself often the most discontent? Is it in family? Is it in your finances? Is it in the way your country is run? The way your neighbors treat you? What area of your life do you find yourself most discontent? Um, I'll tell you, at least for me, the area I often feel the most discontent is in how I treat my body which maybe sounds like a weird thing to you, but um, as much as I would love to have a healthy body, I find myself doing things very often that aren't healthy for my body, and I suffer the results. Well, I wonder what it is for you. Why don't you share that with your life group? After Paul gives us that phrase, godliness with contentment is great gain, he gives us an airtight argument as to why we should be content. He says we've taken nothing into the world, and we're taking nothing out of it. Uh, that is about as airtight an argument as you can get. And yet, it is one of the hardest things for us to believe, isn't it? Why do you think that is? I share with your life group why you think it's so hard to be content, even when you know you're not going to be able to take anything in this life with you. In the sermon on Sunday, I asked, if you had, could remember a time in your life when you were more content than you are now. And I guessed that you, like me, know that that time was when you had less than you do right now. I would love for you, first of all, to share that time of life with your life group. Tell the rest of your group, when were you most content in your life? And then explain why you were so content. Take a couple minutes and do that. The text told us that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Now very often that verse is misquoted. I hear it very often quoted this way, the love of money is the root of all evil, which is not true. There is a lot of evil that comes completely regardless of money. But money, the Bible says, is a particularly sticky root. It's one of those places where a lot of people end up tripping up when it comes to their spiritual life. Why do you think money it's such a hard thing for the human mind to be content with. Why is money very often a root of all kinds of evil? Why don't you share that with your life group? In the second part of the text, verses 17 through 19, the Apostle Paul gets up in Timothy's face and says, Timothy, you have to command this stuff. He says it actually twice, both in verse 17 and verse 18. Why do you think the Apostle Paul told Timothy to command rather than to suggest or convince, or he could have even said preach. Instead, he said command. Why do you think Paul wanted Timothy to be so forceful about the things that he talks about in verse 17 and 18? Take a couple minutes and discuss that. Paul gives two commands to Timothy. He says, command not to do some things and to do other things. First, he says not to be arrogant and not to put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. I want you to discuss as a group, what does it look like to put your hope in wealth? I think we might sometimes think that um, a person who puts their hope in wealth is kind of like Scrooge McDuck, right? Like he like jumps into his big like pool of gold coins and he's like throwing them up and counting them and all these things. Um, I think what Paul is getting at here is a little bit more subtle than that. Um, so see if you can as a group define what is a person who puts their hope in wealth like? How do they treat other people? How do they treat their money? What's their attitude about life? 
Describe that person. The last verse in the second section of the text, verse 19, is where Paul says to Timothy that rich people, as they are generous and rich in good deeds, are going to lay up for themselves treasures in heaven. When you hear that phrase, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, what do you think that means? Take a couple minutes and discuss that. The idea of laying up treasure for yourself in heaven is a very hotly debated issue when it comes to biblical interpretation. But here's what we have to admit. On the one hand, there are some who would say, laying up treasure for yourself in heaven cannot be in any sort of physical, monetary, possession way, right? They take Jesus, or Paul's words very seriously, excuse me, where he says, you know, we're taking nothing out of this world, and there's going to be great blessings in the world to come, but we're not taking these blessings, or we're making more blessings for ourselves in heaven. On the other hand, there will be those who say, your behavior here on earth directly affects some things that are going to happen in heaven to you. So which is it? Well, very often in Lutheran doctrine, when it comes to just about everything but the gospel and the sacraments, it's right in the middle. Now, Lutherans are very balanced when it comes to their theology. And so we would actually say, first of all, yes, your behavior on earth does have some effect on your life in heaven. The Apostle Paul mentions this in 1 Corinthians 3 when he talks about how our behavior is going to give us greater levels of glory in heaven. Now, whatever that means, we're not exactly sure. But the Apostle Paul obviously thinks that there are some who will receive higher levels of glory in heaven. Now, that's not higher levels of bliss. That's not higher levels of blessing. That's not higher levels of love from God. But it is more glory. On the other hand, we want to understand that doing what is right, this side of heaven, is not about getting stuff for ourselves. It is first and foremost about receiving God's grace and then outpouring that grace to other people. And so in fact, if someone were to come to this text and say, you know what, I gotta be generous so that I get more stuff in heaven, they have, in doing that very action, nullified their own goal. <laughs> and so it's really a balance. It's right in the middle. But I think the important thing for us to understand is that God is not going to turn a blind eye to our generosity. As we flow the grace that God has given us out to other people, as we are generous in the way that God has been generous with us, God is not going to forget about us. And the blessings that he can give are far greater than anything we could give anyone else. And so it's the least we can do to give those blessings to other people, to be kind and generous, willing to share. Because in doing so, yeah, we'll lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven, but we may also lead other people to see the life that is truly life, a life that's not bogged down by possessions, a life that's not married to the world, a life that is well, free. It's content. It's great gain because godliness with contentment is great gain. Thank you for spending time in a life group tonight. I pray that you all get home safely and that I get to see you next Sunday as we continue our sermon series for the generations to come. God bless.